Before jumping into today's episode, I do want to put out a trigger warning here as this episode does contain graphic sexual violence and sexual violence towards minors. Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you guys so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it. We also upload the video version onto YouTube as well on Wednesdays. So make sure you are subscribed. Now, you guys, welcome to the very first episode of February. If you guys have been keeping up with some of the last couple episodes, then you would know that we are trying out a little bit of an experiment here on Killer Instinct, and that is that we are dedicating each month to a different true crime category. Now, for last month, January, we dedicated that to unsolved cases, which I just felt was incredibly important to shed some light on the cases that we covered. And now we are in February. And with February, I was really going back and forth on what I wanted to do for the month of February. And I started thinking more and more about what I think of when I think of February. And for me, when I think of February, I think of Valentine's Day, I think of love, I think of romance. And so because of that, I thought, why not dedicate February to the month of killer couples and scorned lovers cases? So that is what we are doing. That is going to be the month of February's true crime category. We have killer couples and scorned lovers. And I truly, you guys, have some of the most horrifying cases that I have ever, ever covered. And we are starting out today with one that I truly could not believe. And I am so interested to hear your opinion on. This is a case, if you have not heard of it, that is going to really leave a pit in your stomach. It is going to show you the worst of the worst kind of people that are in the world, the worst kind of evil, the worst kind of humans. And I'm very interested to hear about what you think of the ending of this case. So as you can tell by the title, today we are talking about the Barbie and Ken killers, otherwise known as Carla Hamolka and Paul Bernardo. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Carla Hamolka was born on May 4th, 1970 in Ontario, Canada to her parents, Dorothy and Carl. Carla's dad was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia and was working as a travel salesman. Now there's little known about Dorothy, but what we do know is that Carla was one of three children and had two other sisters, Lori and Tammy, and Carla was the oldest. Growing up, Carla seemed to be a very happy-go-lucky girl with a bright future ahead of her. She had a lot of friends. She was was absolutely beautiful and something that she was very passionate about was animals. She absolutely loved animals and that's what led her to begin working at a veterinary clinic. Now Carla was very very close to her family. Her parents were incredibly welcoming and loving and she was specifically close to her sisters. The three of them all had infectious personalities. They were all bubbly. They were always known to be laughing with each other all the time. They were always giggling, joking around. They really were were inseparable. And being the big sister, Carla really was looked up to by her younger sisters, specifically the youngest out of the three, Tammy. So that gives you a little bit of a background on Carla. So now let's jump to Paul Bernardo. Paul Bernardo was born on August 27th, 1964 in Ontario to his parents, Kenneth and Marilyn. He was born into a financially well-off family. However, everything else was not so great. He was the third and youngest child of his parents, and it was claimed that Kenneth was sexually abusing Paul's older sister, Deborah, and eventually would go on to be charged with crimes that involved pedophilia in 1975. Paul's mom, Marilyn, also distanced herself from the family when she began developing agoraphobia, which is a type of anxiety disorder that covers different categories of paranoia and fears that are oftentimes rooted in the feeling of needing to escape a situation. So because of this, Marilyn ended up moving into the basement of the home and rarely left the house and really rarely left the basement. So she was really not seen by her 
her children very often. Now, on the outside looking in, Paul was able to present himself as a well-rounded boy, really despite what was going on in his family. He was in Boy Scouts, he had friends at school, but underneath the surface, things were much more sinister. In his teenage years, Paul started talking about how he had fantasies of creating a virgin farm where he would breed virgin girls to rape. It was also around this time when Paul was 16 years old and he ended up getting into a fight with his mom, Marilyn. And during this fight, it actually came out that Paul's dad, Kenneth, was not actually his biological father and that he was conceived during an affair that his mom was having. When Paul heard this, it really made him despise his mom, Marilyn. He started calling her a slut and a whore, and it really created this divide between him and his parents. And he really started to feel like an outcast. And also around this time is when Paul began displaying some violent behavior. One time when an ex-girlfriend broke up with Paul, he responded by setting all of her belongings on fire. In 1996, when Paul was in his early 20s, he already had two restraining orders on him from two separate women. Now, while Paul was successful in finding girls to date, he was charming and he was able to, you know, meet girls at bars and be very social and really suave with them. His ways of keeping them in a relationship with him were borderline torturous. Paul loved humiliating his dates in public and he was incredibly violent when being intimate with the women that he dated. Now, Paul did go to college. He ended up going to the University of Toronto in Scarborough while working a day job in sales. In 1987, Paul and Carla both attended a pet store conference in Scarborough where Paul was living at the time. Now, immediately when the two met, it was described as being love at first sight for Paul and Carla. The two were completely infatuated with one another and they really bonded over their common interests, one of which was sadomasochism. Now, when the two of them met, Carla was living in St. Catharines and Paul was living in Scarborough, like I said. So he would drive about an hour and a half to go and see Carla every so often. Now, when Paul first began coming around to Carla's family and would spend the night, Carla's parents would have him sleep in the family room. That way, the two of them were not sharing a bed together. However, this only lasted a few months before the two of them were able to start sleeping in the same room in the same bed in Carla's family's home. Now, over time, Carla's parents actually really grew to love Paul. They loved the fact that he seemed ambitious and he had drive, but little did they know about the secret lives that both their daughter and Paul were living. In 1987, Paul and Carla got engaged when Paul was 23 years old and Carla was 17 years old. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Carla and Paul both had this same fascination in the sadomasochist lifestyle. Style. From the very beginning, Paul referred to himself as the master in him and Carla's relationship and referred to herself as the slave. Now, this behavior only intensified Paul's desire to begin raping women and attacking women. And not only was Carla aware of this desire that Paul had, she actually encouraged it. Now, when Paul and Carla first got together, Paul let Carla in on a little secret. And this secret that he had was that he had been raping multiple women for months when they first got together. Now, from the information that we have, what we know is that the first documented rape was on May 4th of 1987, and that is the same year that Paul and Carla met for the first time. And according to Carla, Paul confided in her about these rapes when the two of them first met. Now, again, that first documented rape from Paul Bernardo was on May 4th, 1987, when a woman was getting off the bus and she was grabbed by Paul and raped near her parents' home. And over the next week, two other women would experience similar assaults. Now, that was, again, the first known victim of Paul. However, between 1987 and 1990, there were a reported 20 different attacks and rapes through the Scarborough area coming from who we know now to be Paul as the Scarborough rapist. In all 20 of these attacks, these women were between the ages of 15 and 21, and the attacks of them included beatings, verbal abuse, and threats to discourage his victims from going to the police. 
So just to break this down for you, because I know that this can get kind of confusing when we talk about timelines, from 1987 to 1990 is when a reported 20 rapes were committed by Paul Bernardo, the Scarborough rapist. Now, from May to September of 1990, investigators started receiving tips that Paul could have been responsible for all of these rapes. The first tip was in June of 1990, and it was from a coworker of Paul's, but the second tip was from one of Paul's best friend's wives named Tina, who called police telling them that Paul was brought in on a previous rape allegation in December of 1987, but was never interviewed. Now, because of this, police brought Paul in on November 20th, 1990 for a 35 minute interview. And this is where Paul voluntarily provided DNA samples for forensic testing, but nothing came of it. Now, the big thing to remember here is that police never suspected Paul. From the beginning, they always said they never thought it could be Paul. And they really emphasize this because they thought that Paul was not the typical poster child or poster man for someone who would be responsible for this. They said that he was well kept. He was put together. He dressed nice. He was respectful. He answered all of police's questions. And also he willingly gave up his DNA, something that they didn't think that the real Scarborough rapist would do. Why would someone who is guilty give up their DNA? But again, they never tested the DNA after they received it in 1990. So from 1987 to 1990, you have all these rapes. Paul goes into the police station in 1990 in November for a 35 minute interview, gives up his DNA and then goes on his merry way. And that leads us to where we are now in December of 1990. In December of 1990 is where things really take a turn. And I feel like it's important to give you a little bit of a backstory when talking about what happened in December of 1990. Now, for the months leading up to December of 1990, it was clear to Carla that she was not the only woman that Paul was interested in. She could tell that Paul had another woman that was on his mind. Even though the two of them were engaged, she could tell that Paul had another girl that he was interested in. And that girl would be Carla's youngest sister, Tammy Hamolka. Now, from the beginning of their relationship, when Paul would spend the night at Carla's, he over time became obsessed with Tammy. He would start by peeking into her bedroom while she was sleeping, and that escalated into sitting in her room while she slept and masturbated. Now, Carla was fully aware of all of this. She fully knew what was going on, and she knew about Paul's growing fascination with her sister. Now, over time, Paul would actually complain to Carla about how Carla was not a virgin when the two of them first met. And it really bothered Paul that his soon to be wife had slept with someone else other than him. He kept telling Carla over and over again how much it bothered him. However, he did say that even though she wasn't a virgin, Tammy, her younger sister, was. He also went on to say that he was getting bored, so to speak, with the rapes that he was committing and things just weren't, it wasn't giving him the same rush that it used to. So in July of 1990, this is when Carla decides that she is going to give her fiance a gift and that gift is going to be her sister. So in July of 1990, Carla laced spaghetti that she had made with crushed ilium that she stole from her veterinary clinic. So she laces the spaghetti and she gives it to Tammy, who soon later loses consciousness. Now, while Tammy was unconscious, that is when Paul began to rape Tammy while Carla watched. However, after about a minute went by, this is when Tammy began to wake up. But because of her groggy state, it was enough time for Paul to sit situate himself and for Tammy not to know what had happened. So this was the first incident. And sadly, yes, this was not the only time that something like this had happened. After this first incident in July, Carla and Paul knew that this was something that they wanted to do again. So Carla and Paul talked further about the first rape of Carla's sister. And in September of 1990, it was decided by Carla that the Christmas present that she was going to give Paul was going to be her sister's virginity. 
So this leads us to December 23rd of 1990 at the Homolka family Christmas party. So you have Carla's parents, her sisters, Lori and Tammy. Carla is obviously there and so is Paul. Now, mind you, this is six months before Carla and Paul's wedding. So this is supposed to be a very happy time for the family. It's Christmas. Everyone's having a great time together. And during the Christmas party, Carla spikes Tammy's drink with a drug called halothane. And from my understanding, this is basically a liquid general anesthetic that she stole again from the veterinary clinic. Now, later that night when the rest of the family went to sleep and Tammy was unconscious, this is when Carla and Paul moved Tammy into the basement where Carla held a halothane soaked cloth over her sister's mouth while the two of them, yes, both Carla and Paul took turns raping Tammy and videotaping the entire act. Now, at one point during this, Tammy began choking on her own vomit and Carla and Paul began to panic. They quickly hid all the evidence and called 911, who sent an ambulance to the Homolka residence. However, sadly, Tammy never regained consciousness and was pronounced dead at the hospital. Now, when doctors examined Tammy, they noticed a mysterious chemical burn on her face. And what the doctors didn't know was that that burn was from Carla holding the cloth over her sister's mouth. But the drugs in her system were not detected. So her death was ruled an accident as the result of choking on her vomit from alcohol poisoning. And as you can imagine, this was a devastation to the entire family. But no one ever suspected that Tammy's death was an act of foul play. Everyone just ruled it to be a very, very tragic accident. Now, something that you will see as being a pattern here between Carla and Paul is that they videotaped the attacks that they committed, the torture, the rape. They videotaped it all. They videotaped Tammy's attack. And then three weeks after, after Tammy's death, Carla and Paul filmed a video that has been coined to be called the Fireside Chat. Now, in this video, it was filmed in Carla's family home, and it began in the basement where the rape of Tammy took place. And then Carla and Paul made their way up to Tammy's bedroom. Now, during this video, Carla tells Paul that she enjoyed watching Paul rape her sister. And when the two of them were in Tammy's bedroom, Carla even went to the extent of dressing up in Tammy's clothing and pretended to be her. And then the two of them proceeded to have sex on Tammy's bed. So essentially, Carla is role-playing as her dead sister that her and her boyfriend murdered three weeks prior. Now, several weeks after Tammy's death is when Carla and Paul decided that they were going to move in together. So they ended up renting a bungalow in Port Dalhousie that really truly became a house of horrors. So now at this point in the episode, I want to go through and talk about the known attacks that both Carla and Paul committed. And that is going to start us at June 7th, 1991, when Carla invited a 15-year-old girl who throughout the entirety of this case has always been referred to as Jane Doe. So Carla invited Jane Doe back to both her and Paul's home. And upon arrival, Carla drugged Jane Doe until she passed out unconscious conscious. And while unconscious, Carla and Paul sexually assaulted her and videotaped the entire assault. Now, luckily, the girl did survive the attack and regained consciousness with no recollection of what happened to her. However, again, because the assault was videotaped, that is how we are able to tell what she endured during that time. So again, that was the Jane Doe attack on June 7th, 1991. So now that leads us to June 15th, 1991, and this is when one night Paul came across a 14-year-old girl named Leslie Mahaffey standing outside of her home. Leslie was born on July 5th, 1976. She had a younger brother named Ryan, and her dad was an oceanographer while her mother, Debbie, was a teacher. Now, this was on the early morning hours of June 15th, and Leslie had actually missed her curfew because she was attending 
attending a friend's wake and her parents didn't think that she was coming home that night they thought that she was spending the night with a friend so they ended up locking the door again under the assumption that she was not coming home so when paul saw her it was when leslie was standing outside of her home so paul approached leslie outside of her home and that is when leslie asked paul for a cigarette and paul said that he had some in his car and that is when the two of them began walking to paul's car together now while walking towards the car all of a sudden paul blindfolded leslie by throwing a sweatshirt over her head and threw her into his car and then drove the car to his home with carla now, upon arriving home, Carla was waiting for Paul, and when Paul walked in, Carla was told that they had another victim. Now, similarly to the other victims, Carla and Paul began videotaping Leslie's assault, and in the video, you can hear them playing Bob Marley and David Bowie music in the background. You can also hear Paul tell Leslie, quote, you're doing a good job, Leslie, a damned good job. The next two hours are going to determine what I do to you right now, your scoring perfect, end quote. Now, later in the video, Paul can be seen assaulting Leslie by sodomizing her while her hands were bound with twine. Now, while this assault was all happening, Leslie was blindfolded. That way, she wouldn't be able to see what was happening to her or see who was attacking her. Now, after almost 24 hours of torture, Leslie was strangled and killed. Now, here is where a lot of question marks come into play because the question of who did the killing still remains a mystery, whether that was Carla or Paul, because this is when it gets very he said, she said. Carla claims that Paul killed Leslie. Paul claims that Carla killed Leslie. And you might be sitting there being like, well, they have it videotaped. However, Paul and Carla never videotaped the actual kills. So they would videotape the assaults, the torture, the sodomy, the rapes. They would videotape all of that. However, when it came time to the actual murder itself, they would not videotape that. They would turn the camera off. So the question of who killed these girls, who killed Leslie, that was a question that still stood because again, you have Paul saying that Carla did it and Carla saying that that Paul did it. Now, according to Carla, she claimed that Paul killed Leslie by strangling her with an extension cord after Carla gave her a lethal dose of animal tranquilizer. But Paul, on the other hand, claimed that Leslie was strangled by Carla after Carla got jealous and because Leslie's blindfold fell off at one point and Carla was worried that Leslie was going to be able to identify both her and Paul. So Carla just quickly jumped in and killed her herself. Now, the day after Paul and Carla killed Leslie, they were actually hosting Carla's family at their house for Father's Day dinner. So because of this, Paul and Carla decided to put Leslie's body in the basement during that dinner. So everyone in Carla's family comes over. They're all having what they think to be this happy-go-lucky family time, Father's Day celebration, all while Leslie's body is sitting in the basement. Now, after everyone had left, after the dinner, this is when Carla and Paul decided that the best way to dispose of Leslie's body was going to be to dismember her and put her remains in concrete and then throw them into the river. Now, Paul then went out and bought a dozen bags of cement at a hardware store the next day and used his saw to dismember Leslie and then discarded her remains in Lake Gibson. Now, one of the cement blocks ended up not sinking all the way and instead it more so just kind of washed up near the shore and this is when a father and son duo ended up finding it while on a fishing trip on June 29th 1991. Now ironically enough June 29th 1991 was the same day that Paul and Carla got married. So while they were off getting married Leslie's remains were being recovered by police. Now it was through an orthopedic appliance that Leslie had that authorities were able to confirm that the remains found in Lake Gibson did in fact belong to Leslie. 
So now let's fast forward to about a year later, April 16th of 1992, and this was the murder of Kristen French. Kristen French was born on May 10th, 1976 in Ontario to her parents, Doug and Donna. Now, Kristen was extremely athletic. She was super talented. She had won several medals on an ice skating team and was also a member of the rowing team. So on April 16th, 1992, Kristen was walking home from school when she was approached in the parking lot by both Carla and Paul, who were pretending to be lost and pretending to be asking for directions from Kristen. Now, Kristen was mainly talking to Carla during this interaction, telling her where she needed to go and really trying to help her in that moment. However, this gave Paul the perfect opportunity to come up behind Kristen, grab her and force her into their car at knife point. Now, because they were in a busy public setting, the kidnapping was seen by several witnesses. Now, Kristen's family immediately contacted police when Kristen didn't come home because she walked the same way home from school every single day. And this was a 15 minute walk. She knew it like the back of her hand. She was always on a schedule with it. So when she did not show up after school that day, they knew that something was wrong. Now, after Carla and Paul had kidnapped Kristen, they took her back to their home where again, they videotaped themselves torturing, sodomizing and raping Kristen, as well as forcing her to drink large amounts of alcohol. Now, the difference with Kristen's death is that she was actually held captive captive for several days prior to her murder. When it came to Leslie, they really only held her for a little less than 24 hours before finally murdering her. But with Kristen, they waited several days before they finally ended up killing her. Now, the same day that they did end up killing Kristen, Carla and Paul went to Carla's family's home for Easter dinner. So again, this just so happened to fall on another holiday. With Leslie, it was Father's Day. With Kristen, it was Easter. And while they went over to Carla's house, they put Kristen's body again in the basement until they came back. Now, Kristen's body ended up being found on April 30th, 1992, about 45 minutes away from where her school and home was. Medical examiners concluded that Kristen had been kept alive for the majority of her captivity. And when she was found, she was found rolled up in a blanket. However, her body appeared to be washed like they had washed her off in her her hair was cut off, which Carla claimed was for the purpose of trying to stall Kristen from being identified. Now, it did not take police long to realize that the murders between Leslie and Kristen were connected. And along with this, because Kristen's kidnapping was out in the day and it was in public and there were witnesses, police were able to get a composite sketch that resembled Paul Bernardo. Now, during the investigation in May of 1992, so one month after Kristen's murder, Paul and Carla had applied to have their last names legally changed to Teal, which Paul had gotten this name from a serial killer in a movie. Now, part of the reason that they did that was to change their identities and to have them less noticeable. And in May of 1992, police got many calls from friends that knew Paul and Carla personally and had pointed fingers directly at the couple as potentially having involvement in these murders. Now, it took a long time, but finally, in December of 1992, the forensics lab ran the DNA samples that Paul had given them two years prior in those initial interviews. So if we take a moment and go back, as I mentioned, in November of 1990, Paul had gone into the police station and voluntarily given up his DNA to the police. However, again, they did nothing with it at the time. Now, because now we're in 1992 and police are getting more tips that, again, are pointing towards both Paul and Carla, this is when they decide to go ahead and finally run that DNA. Now, there was a lot going on in December of 1992 because not only was this DNA finally getting tested, however, in December of 1992, Paul and Carla also got into a domestic dispute where Paul had beaten Carla with a flashlight. However, she initially claimed that it was a car accident, but her friends did over time start to hear about this dispute that happened and they told her parents. Now, when her parents heard about this, they directly drove over to Paul and Carla Carla's home and removed Carla from the house and drove her directly to the hospital, which is where she gave a statement that she said that Paul had beaten her. And because of this, Paul was then arrested, but he was released soon 
after. So now we're into 1993, the beginning of 1993, and this is when police were finally able to confirm that the DNA that Paul gave almost three years prior at this point was a match to the Scarborough rapist. Now, it is important to clarify that at this point, police were just looking at Paul as the Scarborough rapist. They were not looking at him as being responsible for the murders of Leslie and Kristen. They didn't have any proof of that. And quite honestly, their minds weren't even going there at this point. However, that was until February 9th, 1993, when Carla walked into the police station to have an interview with police and told them what she had been enduring at the hands of Paul. Now, weirdly enough, while Carla was having this initial interview, police placed Paul on a 24-hour surveillance. So they did not go in and arrest him at this point. They were just watching him for 24 hours. So then Carla comes in to have this sit-down interview. And again, from the very beginning, she paints herself as a victim. She paints herself as the battered woman in the relationship. She paints herself as an abuse victim. She paints herself as being, you know, completely destroyed at the hands of Paul. Bernardo. She describes Paul as a dangerous person, as a scary person, malicious, he's a monster, just saying all of these things about him. And then she goes one step further. And that is when she tells police that not only is Paul the Scarborough rapist, but he was also responsible for the murders of Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. So Carla goes on saying that Paul is responsible for all of these crimes. Not only is he a rapist, but he is also a murderer. And in order to prove it, she says that there are videotapes that prove that Paul was responsible for these murders and for these attacks. She said that the videotapes showed Kristen and Leslie being held captive, raped, and tortured. She began recounting the kidnappings of both girls. Carla explained that Paul's purpose for kidnapping both girls was because he wanted to have a sex slave. She then went into detail about both of the kidnappings. She said that when it came to Leslie, that Carla gave Leslie a teddy bear to try and comfort her and that how Leslie was just repeating over and over again that she wanted to see her family. And then when it came to Kristen's abduction and murder, Carla said that she felt a lot of sympathy for Kristen, but she was too scared to do anything about it. She was too scared to let Kristen free because she was afraid of what Paul would do to her. And in fact, that Paul would force her to sometimes get involved with the attacks and participate, but it was never anything that she wanted to do. She just claimed that these were things that Paul would force her to do, and she again followed along out of fear of Paul. She said that Paul had threatened her many, many times and said that he would kill her, he would kill her family, and that again, she was just terrified of this man. Now, you might be sitting here slightly confused because when I told you guys about the tapes, I told you guys that both Carla and Paul were involved in the attacks and that both Carla and Paul were seen on video torturing and raping and just attacking these girls. And so if that were to be the case, why would Carla come forward and talk about the videos? Why would Carla openly admit to these videos? Now, there really isn't a lot of of understanding as to why Carla would do that. However, there are several theories. The first theory is that because she said there were tapes, she is acknowledging them. However, she did say that she did not know where the tapes were. She said that these tapes existed, but she didn't know where they were and police were probably never going to find them. So there's some people that believe that theory. And then there's other people that believe that Carla truly is just so narcissistic that she believed that she would never get caught, that it didn't matter if the tapes were out there. The police were going to find them anyways. She was just getting ahead of it. She was trying to stay one step ahead of police at all times, regardless of what those tapes actually showed. Now, eight days after this interview with Carla on February 17th, Paul was finally arrested. Now, upon arrest, Paul was denying everything from the very beginning. Now, at this point, all they really had was Carla's word against his. And all police knew at this point was that they needed to get their hands on these videos tapes that Carla talked about. They knew that these tapes existed 
and they figured that if they had these tapes, that was what was going to help them lock up Paul Bernardo. Now, Carla told police that the last time she saw the tapes were when they were in the rafters of the garage. However, when police went in and searched the entire house, they did not find those tapes. And again, they looked in the rafters of the garage. Now, during a phone call from jail, Paul told his lawyer, a man named Ken Murray, that the tapes were hidden in a ceiling light fixture in the upstairs bathroom. Now, Ken then went and found those tapes and he actually hid them from investigators which just FYI you can't do that but he did it anyways so Ken and his team viewed these tapes and what they learned in viewing these tapes was that Carla was not the victim that she was portraying herself to be now again from the investigators police standpoint they really saw Carla as another victim they saw her as a victim of abuse at the hands of her husband and she's been manipulated and coerced and all these things but these tapes painted a very very different story and not only did the defense now learn about the tapes and Carla's participation in the attacks of Leslie and Kristen but they also learned about Carla's sister Tammy. Now, not only in Tammy's videotape does it show her being a participant in the acts, it also shows her orchestrating the acts as well. She's telling Paul what to do. She's telling Paul what to say. She's orchestrating how these girls are positioned and what they are doing as well. It's all very evident that she is an equal participant in this at the very least. Now, again, Ken Murray Paul's defense attorney, he hid these tapes from police. So police don't know any of this at this point and Ken used that to his advantage. Now, what this also meant is they really only had, and when I say they, I mean the police, they really only had Carla's word to go off of. Now, Ken's plan, he came up with this mastermind plan when he saw these tapes and his plan was that he was going to hide these tapes from the prosecution until the trial when Carla was on the witness stand he was going to play the tapes and expose Carla for who she really was and in doing this he was hoping to derail the whole case and basically show that Carla was as equal of a participant in all of this as Paul was and from the defense standpoint all they really had to prove is that Paul was not responsible for the murder so if they could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Paul was not the sole person responsible for the murder of Leslie and Kristen and from Ken's point of view he was going to do that by playing these videos in court and having his gotcha moment by doing that he hoped that the jury would find Paul not guilty now again it's very important to emphasize that Ken was not allowed to do this as a lawyer you cannot conceal physical evidence so Ken knew exactly what he was doing now when it comes to Carla in the first few interviews that she had with police she did not mention her sister Tammy at all even though she gave police information about the videotapes she gave them information about the kidnappings about Kristen and Leslie she did not mention Tammy like I mentioned she did say to police that she was forced to also participate in these acts because Paul forced her to do so, which again, police believe was a way of her just trying to cover her tracks and get ahead of police. But she didn't say anything about Tammy. That was until another police interview of hers where she tells police the quote unquote real story or the Carla story about what happened to her sister. Up until this point, police never even gave a second look to Tammy's death. They never thought it was suspicious or that it could have been a result of foul play or it could have had any connection to Carla and Paul. So then Carla goes into the story about what happened to Tammy, which is what I told you earlier. However, in Carla's story, she leaves out the part about her sexually assaulting her sister or having any participation when it comes to the actual attack on her sister. So again, when it comes to Tammy, Carla is painting herself as the victim. She's saying that she is also a victim in this. She's also a victim in her sister's death and that Paul was responsible and made her do it and blah, blah, blah. 
At this point, the prosecution is looking to make a deal with Carla. Now, you might be sitting here wondering, why would they do that? Well, up until this point, like I said, Carla is a victim because they don't know any different. And again, by they, I mean investigators, I mean police, I mean the prosecution. They don't know any different. All they had is Carla's word against Paul's. They know that these videotapes exist, but they do not know that they had been found at this point. So now police make a deal with Carla. So the deal was that Carla was going to plead guilty for two counts of manslaughter for Kristen and Leslie's death. So she was going to get five years for each, so 10 years in total. And then she was going to get two years for the death of her sister. So all in all, 12 years. And then she was going to be eligible for parole in four years. So four years into her sentence, she's eligible for parole. All in all, she gets 12 years. Now we are going to get into all of that in a second, because if you're like me and you're sitting here saying WTF, I know we're going to get into it. Now, once Carla made this deal and the media got a hold of it and it became news to the general public, Ken Murray, so Paul's defense attorney, he began speaking more openly to the media as well. And he started talking very cryptically and almost very like condescendingly towards Carla. He was saying things like the prosecution made a deal with the devil. They didn't think that they would go this far with Carla. But again, Ken knows something that everyone else doesn't, which is that Carla was an equal participant in all of this. So this brings us eight months prior to Paul's trial. So eight months before Paul's trial is going to start. Now, I want to also say that a part of Carla's deal, in order to get the 12-year sentence, she was going to have to testify against Paul in his trial. That was a part of the deal as well. Now, eight years prior to the trial, this is when Ken Murray took himself off the case. Now, it is kind of unclear here whether he took himself off the case or if he was taken off the case, because this is when the news of the tapes came to light. This is when the news that Ken had been withholding the tapes came to light. He held on to these tapes for 15 months. And after consulting with legal authorities who told him that not only do these tapes need to be handed over to another lawyer, but that Ken needs to remove himself from the case, that is when a new defense lawyer comes into play. And that is a man named John Rosen, who became Paul's new defense attorney. Now, John Rosen had the nickname name of Mr. Murder, because at the time he had been the defense attorney for more murder cases than anyone in Canada. Now, the first thing that John Rosen did when he came onto this case is he watched the tapes himself. And I've seen interviews with John Rosen where he talks about the tapes and he talks about them as being the most heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, soul-crushing tapes one could ever watch. He actually said that afterwards he needed to take a break. He needed to go to the bathroom. He cried. He splashed water on his face. And then he went back in to the office with everyone else. And so he watched these tapes as well. And after he watched these tapes, that is when the tapes got handed over to the prosecution, who are now seeing these tapes for the very first time. And they are in absolute horror and shock at this point because now they see that Carla Hamolka was not the victim she painted herself out to be. And now when police are looking at these tapes, they also see something that Carla failed to mention. Remember how I told you earlier, earlier in this episode, that there was a Jane Doe who had been drugged unconscious and attacked by Carla and Paul. Well, Jane Doe's attack was also videotaped. And when Carla was talking to police, she she never mentioned a Jane Doe. Jane Doe was not a part of the deal. So the deal was in relation to Tammy, Kristen, and Leslie, but Jane Doe was never a part of that deal. And when police start looking into the Jane Doe tape, they realize that the entire Jane Doe attack was orchestrated by Carla. They learned that Jane Doe not only was a friend of Carla, but that Carla lured her to her house before Paul was ever home and drugged her during that period. Now, Carla's legal team argued here that Carla suffered from traumatic experiences that led her to have memory loss and amnesia, so she didn't remember the Jane Doe assault. Therefore, she didn't actually lie to police. 
convenient, if you ask me. So let's now get to the trial. So in this first trial, Paul was being tried with two counts of first-degree murder for both Kristen and Leslie, as well as the charges of kidnapping, illegal confinement, and committing an indignity to a human body. So that was the trial for Leslie and Kristen, and then he was going to be tried for the manslaughter of Tammy as well as the other Scarborough rapes in a separate future trial. Now, the main argument from the prosecution when it came to this first murder trial was recounting what Carla Homolka had said to be true. So this is what the prosecution was arguing. Now the defense was arguing that Carla was the one who killed the girls out of jealousy and rage and now she's turning everything back on Paul. They used the argument that the act of the kill was not on the tapes. As I mentioned earlier, it was everything leading up to the kill. So while there is torture and rape and sodomizing on these tapes by both Carla and and Paul, the act of the kill is not shown. So that leads to the question, are we believing Carla who says that the kills were all Paul's doing and that she had no part of that act? Or are we believing Paul who says that it was Carla? Now, as far as the tapes go, these tapes did get shown during trial and there was a lot of back and forth as to whether that should be the case or not and the argument for why they shouldn't be shown really came down to what it was going to do to not only the jurors but the people sitting in the court watching and witnessing the trial as well which also meant the parents of the victim so the parents of both Leslie and Kristen having to see a tape like that at one point it was suggested that only the audio should be played in court and not the actual video but nonetheless it was decided that the entirety of the tapes both audio and video were going to be played in court now Leslie's mom even though she was advised against it decided that she was going to sit in the courtroom and watch the tapes it was something that she felt very passionately about that she wanted to be there for her daughter in those moments however when the tape started playing it became too painful for her to watch and she ended up running out of the courtroom And it was said that her knees just buckled and she fell to the ground on her way out because that's how painful this all was. Now, Carla's mom, Dorothy, took the stand during the trial and she testified that she did not see any evidence that Carla was being abused or terrorized by Paul. She said that Carla oftentimes would go on vacations alone or with girlfriends, meaning that if she wanted to get away from Paul, she could. She said that Carla seemed very happy and was even more happy when she was around Paul. And again, the defense was trying to paint this as very atypical behavior from someone who was apparently scared of Paul. Now, the defense also brought up this fireside chat tape, which again, I mentioned earlier, it is when Carla dressed up as her deceased sister in her clothing and pretended to be her while having sex with her boyfriend. So they really were painting this picture that Carla was not a victim. Now, Paul himself did take the stand during his trial and his whole story was that while he admitted to the sexual assaults and the rapes and the attacks and the kidnapping, he did not admit to the murder. He said that Carla was the one who killed the girls and that he had planned to let them go. Paul even said that in the case of Kristen, what had happened was that Paul left the house for a short period of time to go get movies and snacks to bring back to the house while they were keeping her captive and left Kristen alone with Carla. He claimed that when he came back to the house, Kristen was dead. Paul claimed that Carla told him that Kristen had tried to escape and that at the time, Kristen was wearing a metal choke collar that was wrapped around her neck and Kristen had tried to escape, but somehow the choke collar got stuck and in doing so, she was actually choking herself and Carla claimed that she had to hit her over the head several times with a rubber mallet to subdue her and that is what ended up killing her. Now, Carla herself also took the stand. Now, Carla also took the stand, and John Rosen, who again was Paul's lead defense attorney, he had a very specific strategy when it came to how he was going to cross-examine Carla. Now, when he was cross-examining her, he was essentially saying, you know, to Carla that she wasn't a victim, that this wasn't all just Paul's doing, and he was really kind of chirping at her while she was on the stand, and this in turn made Carla very, very angry on the stand. She got very snippy, she got very cold, she 
she got very angry you could see it in her demeanor and that is what the defense wanted because they wanted the jury to see that Carla was not this innocent woman that she was portraying herself to be. Now, finally, after the trial on August 31st, 1995, this is when the jury began their deliberation and that continued overnight. And then the verdict came back and that is when it was found that Paul Bernardo was guilty of all nine counts that he was charged with, including first degree murder. With the charges that Paul had, he was sentenced to 25 years to life without the possibility of parole for the nine charges. And shortly after this verdict, he then went back to court for the Scarborough rapes and for Tammy's death. And for these charges, this resulted in him being designated as a dangerous offender. Now, I was a little unclear on what this was at first, so I'm going to try and explain it to the best of my ability. So Paul being a dangerous offender, or really anyone being labeled a dangerous offender, this basically means that they will more than likely never get out of prison regardless of the sentence. So it doesn't matter if it's a 25 year to life sentence, doesn't matter if it's a 10 year sentence, it does not matter. If they get designated as a dangerous offender, it basically means that they are not getting out of prison. And from my understanding, this is something that they do in Canada. It's something that they do in England, Wales, Denmark, Norway, and some parts of the United States as well. I believe that this is one of the first cases that I've ever heard of that did do something like this. However, again, this is something that is done throughout other parts of the world as well. Now, the purpose of doing this is to keep offenders in prison that are too dangerous to be released into society, even though their sentences would potentially give them that option. So it's essentially saying, I don't care what your sentence is, you are too dangerous to be out in society, so you are going to remain in prison for the remainder of your life. So that is what Paul received for Tammy's death and the Scarborough rapes. So he got the 25 years to life sentence for the nine initial charges, and then for Tammy's death and the Scarborough rapes, that is when he was deemed a dangerous offender. Now, again, I want to remind you that even though Paul got a life sentence, Carla got 12 years, and again, that was a part of the deal for her participation participation. And as you can imagine, the public had a lot of pushback when it came to Carla's deal. When the media finally released what Carla's deal was and after the trial and people started learning more and more about Carla's participation, people were incredibly unhappy that this is the way that things ended up going. So much so that in 1995, after Paul's trial, there was a new judge that was appointed to look at Carla's case with Jane Doe. However, in May of 19. 1996, three years after Carla's deal was initially made, the judge came back and said that he would not go forward with re-prosecuting Carla after reviewing the evidence. Now, the judge claimed that he would not go back and dismiss the deal that he was had and retry Carla because he would lose all future credibility when it came to deals and cooperating with potential witnesses. And the judge also said that they spoke to Jane Doak directly and that she agreed herself that it would not be best to undo the deal that was made with Carla. However, years later, that Jane Doe came forward and said that that conversation never happened. She was never asked about her input or her opinion on this or if Carla should be retried and that she was never even consulted when it came to Carla's sentence. So now let's fast forward to July of 2005. And this is officially 12 years after Carla's deal was made and she was released after everything. Now, there were some conditions upon Carla's release, and those were as follows. Carla was to tell the police her home address, her work address, and who she lived with. She also had to notify them if any of that changed. She's required to notify police if she changes her name. And if she is planning on being gone from her home for more than 48 hours, she has to give a 72-hour notice. She also cannot contact Paul Bernardo or any of the victim's families. She cannot hang out with anyone under the age of 16. I'm not sure why she would, but that is in there as well. She also cannot consume any drugs. She was required to get therapy and she is required to provide a DNA sample. So those are all the stipulations that Carla is living under. However, she still is 
free. It was actually reported in 2007 that Carla gave birth to her son. However, the father still remains a mystery. It was theorized. People did think that the father of Carla Hamulka's children could be Luca Magnata, who, if you remember, is the murderer from the Don't Fuck With Cats documentary. However, he publicly denied it. Now, where Carla lived was a mystery to the public for a very, very long time until 2016 when it was reported that she was living in Quebec with her three children. So now she has three children. She's living in Quebec and she did change her name. So she did have to inform authorities that she was doing that and that she moved. And she changed her name to Leanne Teal and sometimes goes by Leanne Bordeaux. Now, personally, I find the Leanne Teal name to be very unsettling because if you remember, I mentioned it briefly earlier that Teal is the same last name that both her and Paul tried to change their last names to after the murders of Leslie and Kristen. And Teal was used because that was the name of a serial killer that Paul liked in a movie. So the fact that they would even let her change her last name to that is a little strange to me. But again, I digress. Now, the public was very much not happy that they did not know where Carla was living up until it was released that she was living in Quebec. And that was because her kids started going to school. People started seeing her and recognizing her. It was said that she moved to Quebec because that is where she was not recognized as much. It was far away enough in Canada where she wasn't as recognized. The media wasn't hounding her as much. So that is why she went there. But again, the public was very much not happy at the fact that they did not know where she was living they felt like they had a right to know that just because she is a danger to society is what they believe and also once parents learned that their kids were going to the same school as Carla Homolka's children it really outraged a lot of parents who were not happy that this was kept from them either so people were very much unhappy about Carla Homolka's release and the fact that she was you know living in society and doing the normal things that everyone else was doing even after everything that she did now as far as Paul Bernardo goes he has continuously tried to apply for parole since 2008 however again he will likely never be released due to his dangerous offenders status and his next parole hearing is actually scheduled for this month February 2024 but again he has the dangerous offender status he more than likely will never be released from prison but that you guys is the case of Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo and the Barbie and Ken killers I'm so interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case specifically when it comes to Carla Homolka and the deal that was made how everything was handled so please let me know your thoughts on this case in its entirety as well I am really sick to my stomach over this case if I'm being very honest I think that the fact that someone is able to do this to their own family member just being able to do this in general being able to be such a vile evil monstrous human being you aren't even a human being at that point however to do something so vicious to your own sister actually makes me sick so that's where what I think about all of it and I think that You know, her 12 year sentence was definitely strategic and beneficial on her part. However, again, I believe it was just very, you know, strategic. That's what it was. And it was calculated and she knew what she was doing. And so that's my opinion on it. But I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say. So please let me know in the comments below. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys and until then stay safe bye guys